Hello everyone and welcome to the latest CHEM webinar. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening wherever you are in the world today. Thank you so much for joining us. Before I start, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping points with you. Um, so Sue, if you could please move the slide on. Um, you may have noticed that your microphones are muted. Um, they will stay on mute as we go through the session just to avoid any background noise. Sue and I are also both hosting this webinar from home. So if, you, um, if there are any in issues with our internet connection, please bear with us. Um, there'll be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any burning questions about um, Incus or about the um, presentation that Sue's going to be showing for us today, um, if you just pop these in the questions box as we go through the webinar, you can I also post um, comments in there as well too. Just a flag, if you're having any technical difficulties with either sound or video, please let us know in the questions box and I'll do my best to resolve them. We recommend that you use headphones to listen to this session today for the best sound quality. And also just a flag that we are recording the webinar. So we'll send you the video recording by email straight to your inbox next week. Um, so don't worry if you miss anything or if you need to tune off um, a little bit early, we will send that recording to you and you'll be able to forward it to your colleagues as well so they can watch it too. Next slide, please, Sue. So we've got quite a, um, a packed agenda this morning. Sue Holt will be delivering the presentation. This will be followed by a very quick overview of what's new at CHEM before I pose your questions and comments to Sue. Next slide, please, Sue. And just in terms of introductions, so I'm Kate McKim. I'll be hosting your webinar this morning. I'll also be doing my best to resolve any technical queries that you have. Um, and just making sure that we um, um, that I ask those questions and comments to Sue at the end as well. And next slide, please, Sue. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Sue Holt. She's going to be taking you through the session on Incus, getting more from your data. Sue has extensive experience in international education um, and has held various posts in schools, including deputy head curriculum, head of secondary, as well as vice principal. Her work has taken her around the world. Um, so she's worked in China, Peru, Brazil and Argentina, Spain, Qatar, Jordan and Switzerland. Um, Sue recently left full-time international school leadership to pursue her interests in consultancy, particularly in the relation to the use of data, teaching and learning, assessment, effective CPD and curriculum, as well as budget planning. Um, and now, without any further delay, over to Sue to start the presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kate, and thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. Um, this is aimed mainly at um, school leaders and you know heads of year, uh, but it's also useful for class teachers. Just a reminder of what INCAS gives you. INCAS is the computerized adaptive assessment test for ages five to 11. I'll come on more to that because I know there are many international schools online here this morning. Uh, it provides you with measures for reading, spelling, maths, and developed ability. And there's also a section on attitudes to reading, maths, and school. Um, for many international schools, though, you might find that if your children do not have much English language at age five, you might um, prefer to test when they're six or seven. Uh, that's just a little um, extra bit of information for those of you who might be working in schools where there's a lot of students who don't have much English. What does the data tell you? Well, I think it's very important to distinguish between attainment and developed ability. The reading and math subsections show attainment linked to what the child has been taught, whereas the developed ability section is largely curriculum free. It's not directly linked to what has been taught. It gives an indication of how well the child can access a curriculum taught in English. And I expect that most of you are either English medium schools or bilingual schools where a proportion of the curriculum is taught in English. And there are two parts to that developability test, which are, I think, exceptionally useful. Um, one is a picture vocabulary test, and the other is a nonverbal test. Clearly, the picture vocabulary test um, is a measure of 
their command of the English language. But the non-verbal test by this very title uh, does not rely on language. And the non-verbal test is often the best measure of ability for children who have English as an additional language. Now, those children, um, well, it can be a double-edged sword, really, for them. If they've got a particular learning difficulty, then teachers might assume that their difficulties are caused by their lack of English, so their underlying difficulty is not met. Similarly, if their attainment is low, teachers might underestimate their ability when it's actually an English problem. So that nonverbal test can give very useful data, which helps you meet the needs of those children most appropriately. So for class teachers, in addition to what you know about the child from prior reports and school records, the data immediately provides a picture of the class so that you can easily identify the areas you might need to focus on a whole, you know, as a whole class. For example, if you find that um, they're all a bit weak on their mental maths, then that, that might be an area that you need to concentrate on. If you find that in general, their reading comprehension is quite poor, then you might need to adjust how much time you spend on reading comprehension um, every week. So it gives you that picture of the class. Please bear in mind that this data is an additional tool it's information that you use in addition to what you know about the child. In many schools with a high turnover of students, at the beginning of the school year, it might take you a couple of months to really get to know the individuals within the class. Whereas this gives you points of focus so that you can get to know the children better and quicker. And that obviously helps their progress. And of course, for each individual child, you get um, a whole series of data on their reading subtests, on their maths, on their developed ability, so that you can meet their individual needs and not just the needs of the whole class. So it gives you a whole raft of information that I think makes you get off the mark a bit quicker at the beginning of the school year, which is, of course, when I advise you do the tests. The data also provides middle and senior leaders with class profiles so that you can identify the needs of different classes because they're all quite they're, they're very often quite different within the year group and you can also have a look at the year group profiles because cohorts can vary so you would know that um, the intake of different groups can vary quite a lot from year to year and i'm sure in the staff room people will often be making comments like oh year three isn't as good this year as last year um, I think sometimes they forget, um, but it's, it's certainly worth comparing those profiles to see if their needs differ. And it also gives you a whole school profile so that you can see where your school fits into um, the average of all the schools which are in these um, surveys. But then if you've got all of that data, what point is having it unless it's used properly? In many years of interviewing staff coming in for jobs, um, I've asked them always as one of my interview questions of um, what data do they use or what data is used in the school. And all too often, uh, I've had comments like, oh, well, the, um, the senior team use that data. But I can see there's absolutely no point in having that data unless it's properly shared. So the evidence from the data could be used to identify the needs. And I would say that's something that you kind of co-produce with your teachers. It isn't just the um, year group leader or the senior leader sitting on high, identifying those needs and telling the teachers that they have to address them. It needs to be a collaborative process where the data is examined and the needs are shared and identified together. And then the next um, use of the data is to, after, after you've identified those needs, you need to effectively deploy resources. And I'd like to spend a little bit more time on what I mean by that. Um, for example, if you have um, a three form entry year three, and when you look at the needs of the three year three classes, you find that their needs are really quite different. 
that in one class there are a number of students who've got particular needs. In another class, you might find there are some really able students. And you find that in one class, there is a huge range of ability. Now, if you have teaching assistants, uh, very often it's kind of one per class. Is that the best way to deploy those teaching assistants? Would it be better if one class had a bit more time with the teaching assistant at certain times of the week and another class didn't? Does it have to be one TA per class? Or could one class have two thirds of a TA and the other class have one and a third? So I think you need to look, um, you know, just radically look at those resources. Look at the nature of your teaching team. We all know that different teachers have different strengths and weaknesses. And I think they are often not deployed as effectively as they could. I think when you're making up the team, you don't just say, well, this is a year three team, a year four team, a year five team. You look at how the teacher can further increase their skills throughout the year. So you're using their teaching is also their kind of in-service training. What skills the teacher can share with others? In most schools I've gone into as part of getting to know the staff, I've asked them to um, identify areas where they could share their expertise and areas where they felt they needed some support. That could often lead to pairing up and a bit of you know, in-school mentoring. But I suppose it was a bit sneaky of me, really. I often used it as the basis for um, in-house in-service days because we had people who identified that they had some skills, but they weren't expecting to be running a session in an in-service day. And I found that those in-house in-service days were extremely useful. And all sorts of things came out of it. There was an, in one school where the teacher said her only skill was dance because she basically didn't want to run a session. But what I, I mean, people weren't forced to. Um, and from being encouraged at the beginning, I then found people knocking on my door saying they wanted to. And um, it, it led to a very um, active dialogue with staff. But coming back to the, uh, the teacher who put down that she enjoyed dance, I actually had her run a whole, whole school uh, line dancing class as an energizer session on um, the afternoon session of our in-service day. And it was really effective. It was very good fun. So please use your teachers as um, effective resources and look at how you deploy those resources. I would also say that I mean, all schools are very conscious of their budgets and running in-house in-service days is very cost effective. It's much cheaper than flying somebody in for a day, even though they can be useful. So identify the needs, effectively deploy those resources and your teaching staff are probably your best resource. And um, use that, having identified the needs, to inform your school development priorities. I do not think that you can come up with an idea for development unless you've got some evidence of need, not a perception of need, evidence of need. And then of course, after you've um, employed your strategies, you need some data to evaluate the effectiveness. So many schools are data rich, but unfortunately many schools do not use that data to its best advantage. Okay, so a useful starting point of these box and whisker plots, the age comparison charts. And I'm going to spend some time explaining these. When I first saw these myself, I wondered what on earth I was looking at. So I shall go through, this is one particular class and it's looking at the reading assessment. So, you have the box. I'm going to hope you can all see my mouse. This is the box. And inside that box, you've got 50% of the children in the class. And the line across the middle, here, this one, is the median line, which is the middle score when all these scores are placed in order. The top um, whisker, is the top 25 percent 
and the bottom whisker is the bottom 25%. The width of the box, if you can see here, age and years along the bottom, the width of the box shows the age range within that class. Now, some classes might have a wider age range, so you get a wider box. Um, if you've got a mixed age class and you've tested them all at the same time, then it will be a very wide box. The green line is the average score for a child of that age. So obviously here, that's an eight-year-old child, and so their age equivalent score would be eight years. So this is the average. So as the median score, and I suppose more than half the box is below the green line, then overall this class is below average for reading. Each, each child is a dot. So this shows the actual dots. And I will go back and forwards between these, um, these graphs um, as we go through. So I'll just give you a moment to take that in if you aren't familiar with it. So each dot is a child. The box is 50% of the class. The line across the middle is the median or the middle score if all the scores are in rank order. This is comparing them to the average for all children. Each dot is a child. And then what you can do is that you can toggle those dots and get the name of each child. So you can see the individual children. And you can see that the, um, the plot for reading shows the average slightly below the average attainment overall. And counting up there, you can see that seven children are above and nine are below. Let me just um, move back. So, oh gosh, I've gone the other way, sorry. So um, if you were to be explaining some of this data to a parent, and obviously by having the dots rather than the names, then you can show where their child is if you would choose to do that. There might be some circumstances where you would. If a child was um, really struggling, for example, this child down here, you could say, well, this child is really struggling with their reading, therefore we're doing some extra assessment, or therefore we're having some special extra reading support, or whatever. And of course, that would show the parent the data without um, any confidentiality issues. And then, of course, if you're discussing it with colleagues, you might want to have the child's individual name showing, and you could have a little look there. Um, you would often find uh, that there were some students who were, or some children who were outside the range. They were said so that they were outside the whiskers, and they'd be called the outliers. And those outliers would have um, special needs, either because they were so gifted and talented, um, or that they were. Um, not attaining as well as the others. Let me just move on to the next slide. Uh, so I keep a picture in your mind of where they, where that box is for reading. And this is the same group of students for maths. So the box appears to have moved up, showing that maths attainment is higher than in reading. In other words, there are far more students above average, and the median the middle mark is above average. But if you also look at the range of scores in that class, the range of scores so that there are, there are children who have um, uh, an age equivalent score for maths of about you know, below six. And there are some, uh, there's one child in the class up there who has an attainment, um, an equivalent score of almost 14. So the teacher is coping with a huge range of attainment within that class. And so again, where do you put in your TA support? How do you organize the groupings? Um, it appears that maths is much stronger than reading. Is enough emphasis being placed on reading in the curriculum for that particular year group? And I know there are many international schools um, listening this morning, and I'm sure that many of you will find that reading scores in general are below the math scores. So do you need to have more emphasis on your reading? You know, that is a, a leadership decision 
and it's something that you have to deal with. But I would say that um, ability to, to read and literacy is the key to the curriculum. And they need their literacy to really access all the maths as well. Going back to those in-house in-service days, one of the best sessions I attended um, on literacy was actually run by a maths teacher. It was in a, it was in a, a secondary, um, well, it was actually an all-age school, but it was a secondary maths teacher who was running the, um, the training session on English as an additional language for all colleagues, whatever part of the school they taught in. And I was fascinated to see what a maths teacher would have to say. He had worked in Africa and he actually spoke um, some Swahili. So we all went in for our maths lesson with him and he began the maths lesson in Swahili. He handed out the worksheets, he told us what to do. We had no Swahili speakers in his, uh, in his class and, um, and of course we couldn't do it. We couldn't follow his instructions until he did it in a much more visual way. And no matter how loud and how slowly he said it, if he was saying it in Swahili, we didn't get it. But by the end of the session, we all had a few words of Swahili, as well as being able to follow what he was doing. So um, teaching the English is not just the job of the English teachers or the class teachers for everyone, if you've got some math specialists or any, any specialist in there. But I think it's very important that you look at the areas of general strengths and weakness to decide a, your curriculum structure and what your priorities are moving forward. Another useful one for um, the, the year leaders in particular, but also for the senior leaders, is to have a look at all the classes in the year group. So this takes all of year five and puts all their data um, onto one little visual display. So are the classes broadly equivalent? In this case, I suppose they are. Um, you would see the median um, is generally in about the same position, uh, that all the classes seem to be above average for the general maths module. I would say that this class has a bigger range of ability and might be harder to teach. There are also some outliers, some very high ability children and are, they need, are their needs being met? And there are also, oops, I've just moved on too quickly. And down here, we can see that there are some students who are really quite challenged. Now, if you teach all your maths at the same time, could you do some cross year group groupings rather than having them all um, just taught within their class? Are there some times during the week where you might want to um, give some more challenging work to some of these students? So having that data there will help you identify. And again, like before, you can toggle it so you can see um, who those students are. I mean, the class teacher would know, but it would help you ask a few questions. And how best can you support the outliers who are at the bottom of the, um, the range. It might just be that they've had lack of educational opportunity, or they might be, be held back in their maths because they don't understand the English. It might be that they have generalized learning difficulties. So this is an extra piece of data to help you to form those judgments, and also to come up with a strategy of how you're going to deal with it to support the teachers who are supporting the children. So the next steps, compare the classes across all modules. Are the needs of each class equivalent? And if they're not, what are you going to do about it? As I mentioned earlier, do they all have the same access to teaching assistance? And if the needs are different, should access be altered to better meet the needs? Um, looking at the attainment over the year, if their attainment is very different, is this linked to the teaching? I'm not saying the teacher, I'm saying, is it linked to the teaching? 
I mean, I do agree that teachers are accountable, but do you need more training on maths in a particular year group or in a particular class? Might it be worth considering groupings across year groups for literacy, especially to meet the needs of any outliers? Um, when I worked in Cata, I was in charge of a middle school and it was a very large school. We had, we had 10 form entry. And so I put teams together of, um, of five groups at a time because 10 was just too much to handle all in one go. But they, but they were very carefully put together, um, looking at the skills of the teachers. You know, we had some teachers who were extremely creative. We had some who were particularly good at teaching maths. We had others who were extremely affected in moving on um, slow readers. So I tried to, within each team, have a range of skills. And of course, as in all schools, uh, there was shared planning. And the shared planning uh, was extremely useful, but it needs to be tweaked according to the needs of the class. And I think it's, um, it, it can be a quite worrying if the planning becomes a bit formulaic, if you just grab the planning you know, out of the online file or even the filing cabinet. Um, I think it can provide the basic structure, but there must be that adaptation to plan for the individual needs within a class. But it's very important to use the expertise of each teacher in the team to its fullest. And it also helps in training all the teachers in the team and upskilling them. So I think all of these things need to be brought in mind when um, planning your teams to actually meet the needs of the strategy that you've developed, having identified the need. You will also find as senior leaders that your cohorts vary. Um, in some international schools, it can be linked to company moves. Um, in one school I, um, I worked in, there was a, an Italian company moved into that city and lots of the Italian mother tongue children suddenly joined um, the early years of the primary school. So there was suddenly um, a large increase in the number of students who needed extra English support. So it was only in a few year groups, it wasn't across the board. And here we have um, all the data for developed ability um, for a particular um, primary school. And you would see that overall, the developed ability is average to slightly below average, but with a very, very wide range um, in all year groups. There is a very wide range, but in particular, year two um, seems to be quite low. So it's not giving you any answers, but it's just giving you a few questions to ask. So why is year two's developed ability lower than the other year groups? One possible reason is that if you remember the developed ability test, consists of a picture vocabulary test and a non-verbal test. And it might be that in year two, there are a number of students who need extra support with their English, which is what you might expect if they're quite new to it. However, by the time you've got you know, up to year five and six, there are still some issues there. And again, that might need to be looked at and you can go through each of the assessments and get a picture of that so you can see whether or not language is an issue or whether just in general by the nature of the um the clientele you have that uh, they are uh, um, below average in terms of their ability on that though i would remind you that the that intelligence is not fixed that the brain is plastic and given the right stimulation that everyone can develop in their intelligence So, having looked at your cohort data, what are the challenges facing year two? As I've said, literacy is often a problem at this stage. And again, consider the redeployment of your resources. 
what extra support do you need in year two? Do you need more teaching assistance? Do you need more English as an additional language specialists? Do you need more learning support? And of course, I'm aware of budgets. Where is this going to come from? If the needs are different, don't make the provision across all year groups the same. Do you need extra staff training? If so, who needs it? When do you need it? And I would say you need it as early as possible if you're going to supercharge any initiative. There is very little point in identifying the needs at the beginning of the school year, but not have any training till you've got your um, in-service training day scheduled six months into the school year. It needs to be front loaded. So I think that the training, the identification and the training have to be closely um, linked and they have to be at the beginning of the school year if you're going to have an impact. I'm conscious of time, let me go on. How do you know if you've been successful? So at the beginning of the year, you've identified needs, you've developed your strategy, you've put in the training, you've put in the resources. And then a year later, you want to see if your initiative has been successful. And of course, in the business of education, success is measured by pupil progress. And what you get are little progress charges, uh, charts if you test every year. So this child, Italy, was tested when he was eight. And you can see that um, he was functioning about two years above his actual chronological age. And that trend continued. Because when he was nine, he was functioning at the age of 11. So he was continuing to make steady progress well above his age equivalents. But if we look at this one, we see that France was above average when he was just over eight and well below average when he was just over nine. What has happened to him? The green line is the average score. The, um, I'll talk more about the little diamonds and lines in a moment. But there's something gone wrong with him. Now, it might be that France has missed a lot of schooling. It might be that he's had COVID. Um, it might be that there's been um, a major change in his family circumstances. So you know more about that child than that piece of data. But we do know that something's happened to his maths, which is probably more than just having a bad day. On the other hand, if we look um, at Haiti, uh, we can see that um, he was just below average. Uh, his, his test score was just below average when he was eight and a bit. And now it's just above average when he's nine and a bit. So he's making encouraging progress. And of course, if you do this for all the students, for all the modules, you will get your picture of what's happening within the year group. Now have a look at Italy here. Now it looks like he's going downhill a bit, but that is probably not the case. The black diamond is the actual score that Italy achieved on the day he took the test. The little lines either side are the confidence limits. That means we are reasonably confident that should Italy take the test again on a different day, that his score would lie within that range. Then we have a look at, so there he looks to be above average. And when he's nearly nine and he takes the test, it looks like he's just bang on average. So has he gone down? Well, if you look at the, the, um, the whiskers, the confidence limits, you will see that the confidence limits of both assessments overlap. And so as the lines between both scores overlap, that you can see that there is a possibility that if he'd taken the test on different days, then his scores could have been about the same. So there is no significant difference. So don't just look at the diamonds, look at whether or not those um, confidence limits overlap. If the confidence limits, uh, limits overlap, there is no significant difference. So, Italy's developed ability score um, 
is very probably not going down. And of course, this is the trend we would like to see. We can see that Italy's reading was average to above average when he was about eight, but now it's significantly above average when he's nine, so he's making really good progress. So to summarize, INCAS is a highly effective tool. Now, I'm, I've worked in all age schools um, all of my career, really. Um, although I was secondary trained, I was particularly interested in how the younger students made progress. And I did actually some extra postgraduate qualifications in assessment, working particularly with younger children. Um, I love all the the chem data because it's um it's very it's very well researched and it's very effective but my favorite i have to say is incas because it gives you so much information um it helps you establish the baseline it's really effective at, at identifying needs and that's for individual pupils for year for classes for year groups for cohorts um for you as school leaders it tells you what's needed for staff training and resources, in addition to your professional judgment. It actually gives you a focus for devising your strategy and, and deploying your resources to meet those needs. And it also gives you tools to evaluate the success of the strategy by measuring pupil progress. So I think it's kind of unbeatable. And I really don't know how schools can function without the effective use of data. Um, there is so much there at your fingertips, which will actually help you do your job most more effectively. So I think now it's um, it's time for me to pass back to Kate. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, that was really, really insightful and, and incredibly useful. I find I found that um, absolutely fascinating, and I I know our delegates have too. Um, so before we go on to the Q and A session. Um, I'm just going to share a quick highlight of what's new at CHEM. If you tuned into our webinar on Tuesday, you would have already heard about this, but just wanted to flag this with you. So we've launched a brand new project called Co-Creation and we need your help. So Co-Creation for us is about collaboration. It's about people like yourselves who use our products and who use INCAS and CHEM assessments aspiring us. It's about us developing your ideas to drive innovation and we really want to work with you to make our products and services even better. Um, so we would like to hear your ideas firsthand if you have any, um, you know, whether you're a coordinator, a teacher or a senior leader, as it's your dynamic ideas that can help us make changes and bring benefits to not only yourselves, um, but your colleagues and a wider range of customers too. So if you have any ideas that you would like to share with us on anything you would like us to um to, to work on in terms of INCAS or our assessments, um, you can do that at our page and you can also vote on ideas that you would mo most like to see happen as well. Um, so you can visit our co-creation page at www.chem.org forward slash submit hyphen idea. Next slide please Sue. And now it's over to you um, our delegates so if you have any more burning questions and comments for Sue please just post these in the questions box um, so if there's anything from um, you've seen in Sue's presentation or about Incas you can just just post those in the questions for, box for us so I've got a couple here already Sue for you um, there are a couple okay. of really interesting questions that have come through um, so I've got one from a delegate who said that they're new to using INCAS. They've just introduced it this year. They've asked, how would you introduce CHEM to each stakeholder? So that's classroom teachers um, as well as, as parents and other key stakeholders too. OK, well, with um, children, we we'll start with the children. I would say that they're going to do some little quizzes on the computer, which is going to um, help the teachers help them better and um, my experience of working with the children directly um, because the modules are you know like 20 minutes or so long each is that you know don't do it all in one day because otherwise they're spending time looking at the screen all day and they can lose a bit of concentration but um, they generally love it they just think they're playing a computer game 
And um, because they're, the tests are adaptive, they're not um, threatening for children because if they, um, if they don't get the question right, they're given an easier one. So the most um, challenged um, children um, aren't stressed by it. And at the end of each little module, as you'll know, they get a little round of applause, so they feel really quite happy that they are actually successfully completing each module. So they, don't, they just see it as little quizzes. Of course, they'll probably go home and tell their parents that they spent half the day in front of a computer. Well, no, a few minutes in front of a computer. Some of them will, some of them won't. Um, but I think it's important to tell parents that they're, they're going to, you're going to be doing some testing, that it's not um, uh, a, a test which is going to affect their, their futures. You know, it's not something you get a certificate for. That is just um, an in-house um, series of, of quizzes so that we can identify children's needs, so that we can um, you know, meet their needs better, so that we can improve the quality of their teaching and learning. Um, for teachers, I think it's important to stress that this is something which is going to help them help the children better by you know, all the things I've said. It gives them a picture of their class so they can get to know their class faster than just having to get to know them over that first term. And again, you know, school reports from different schools are very variable. And uh, I think as mentioned in previous presentations, I've looked at so many reports that would say something like, um, you know, Patrick is making good progress, but it doesn't tell you where Patrick started and where he got to. So the reports don't actually tell you much. So this actually means that you've got the same information um, for every child in your class. So that really helps the teachers. Um, certainly some teachers can find uh, the data threatening if it's not presented right. They think that it's going to be something which is used to check up on them, to see if they're teaching properly. That, you know, um, and of course, all teachers are accountable, but this is not a performance management tool um, for judging a teacher. It's actually identifying the needs of children in your school and helping the teachers meet those needs better. And I think if the needs are co-identified collaboratively with the teachers, rather than just something on high from the school leadership team, then um, it becomes a much more meaningful um, operation to use this data. It's really important that the data is shared um, and shared effectively with all the teachers. Now, you, the, the person who's posed the question, this is their first year to introduce it. And I think for those who have been using it for a few years, are you still using it as effectively as when you first started? Because um, quite often with initiatives, there's a, a burst of enthusiasm and then it tapers off because there's an assumption that everybody knows how to use it and is using it. So unless you keep revisiting actively every year, and I don't mean that you have to listen to the same presentation every year, but unless you go through the data with people every year and you co-construct your priorities every year, then it won't be effective. Does that answer all the questions? I hope it does. Thank you, Sue. That's fantastic. Yeah, that that's, um, yeah, you've definitely answered their question there. And I think that's a really good point about, um, if you're, you know, you're using the data, you know, you're using the data and you've used it for quite some time, keeping that momentum going is important, I think. It's very important, yes. So we've got another question here, again, for someone who's just started using INCAS. Do you have any top tips for embedding the use of INCAS data for a school that has just started using INCAS? We're looking for some, some ideas and top tips. Okay, um, I don't know whether you listened to my presentation on, on Tuesday, but I'm sure Kate can make available to you. I think I went through some of that there. I think the top tip is to um, spend time with the class teacher or the year group, um, very much focused on their individual data rather than generalized data, so that you spend some time looking at that data, it is time consuming, but if you've invested in INCAS and you've, you've established, you're making some priorities, and if you're going to get the most effective use of it, then I think you need to spend some time 
actually going through the data with each class teacher. You might find that within each team of class teachers, you have someone who is um, a bit of an expert anyway and can actually lead that. So make use of the expertise you have in in-house. If you don't have much ex expertise in-house, then the person who has the expertise has to cascade it out. So it's shared between year leaders who will share it with the teachers. But there's, um, there's no quick fix. The top tip is to spend time going through the individual data. And I think at that moment, you will get that light bulb moment where a teacher will maybe just um, with one child will suddenly see something that makes them question how that child is progressing. And it also, you know, if you've got, if you look at those box and whisker plots with the teacher and you compare them across a year group, then, you know, you can actually say to the teacher, I do appreciate that you've got a huge range of ability to deal with in your class. Let's see how we can meet the needs of those students and how we can help you meet those needs. So I think if they see it, if the class teachers can see it as a means to help them and that they've got an empathetic uh, leadership uh, working with them rather than, you know, handing down wisdom from above, then that really, um, really makes it effective. I think it's a case of everybody rolling their sleeves up and working as a team. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, another question here. So this delegate has said, are, some of our staff are quite um, unsure about how reliable, et cetera, the data is. And they're a little bit, um, I think data cynic is, is the word that's used here. Um, how, how would you get buy-in from those teachers? How would you reassure them? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because I've come across this so many times. I've met with resistance. I've introduced Kem into a number of schools and I've met with resistance, um, you know, who think that this is replacing their professional judgment. And it's not. It's another tool in the tool chest. And I think once they start seeing that, their, that the data very often matches their perceptions. Um, you know, that's a very encouraging thing. But I think what the, the, the key to it is that is when they have to question if their perception is very different from the data. Um, I think it's it, you know, the key point so that the, the, um, the, the data is, um, is a, a snapshot, not a label for life, and that um, they should question if, if a child has um, performed worse than they expected, then they should probably trust their own judgment because they've got evidence for that. But if a child has performed better than they expected, then they should believe the, um, the high performance because it's very difficult to overperform in a test. They should also look very carefully at the confidence limits. Um, I mean, when they've been doing, say, reading assessments in the past, it might say that um, the child's reading age is between six years, six months and seven and seven years, no, no months. So there's, there's always, you know, it's, it's what I was showing with those confidence limits. There's the result on the day. And then there's the, um, that we're reasonably confident that the result, if they were to take it again on a different day, would, between, would be between these, these levels. Um, I actually, when I first started using INCAS, I was doing a, um, a postgraduate diploma and I compared INCAS with some of the assessment tests that were available at the time, like some of you might be familiar with like written rest and uh, RAT and the, um, the Neil analysis. And I compared the results that I, that, was, that I was getting on these rather time consuming tests with what I got on INCAS and they were absolutely spot on. And you know, what I found was that um, the, I could get the data for a whole class in the time it took me to assess one child. Um, so, uh, you know, my own personal experience was that comparing the INCAS results with the results of different tests was extremely encouraging. But I think more importantly is that all of the um, CHEM projects have been devised by um, researchers and education, not just a commercial enterprise. It's based on very sound educational research um, over thousands of students over a long period of time. I mean, they, the Chem Center trials their projects in the same way 
I would say that um, doctors trial different medicines and that they don't release it till they're absolutely sure it's going to work. So I would present that kind of information to the, to the doubters and you will always get doubters and especially those who are insecure and think it's going to be used as a means of, you know, a stick to beat them up with, which is obviously not the intention. Thank you so much, Sue. I've just had a huge thank you there in, in the, the questions box. That's got, very nice. Thank you very much. We've got um, another question here, which I think I might have to um, just check in with my colleagues on, but just wanted to put this to you, Sue, as well. So a delegate has asked, how can we use our information to benchmark nationally, uh, regionally and internationally? Um, so in terms of the assessment, obviously, it's based on the students taking the assessment. But I just want, wondered if you wanted to quickly comment on that, Sue. Um, I think actually there's a lot of development going on. I haven't seen it for INCAS, but I was looking at some media um, stuff recently. And you could compare things against um, international schools, COBIS schools, BSME schools, Fobosia schools. Um, you would have to ask the teams who are developing this rather than me. But I think, um, you know, the Chem Centre is undergoing a, a, a fantastic phase of development that's getting even better. Um, and so I would say that um, that could go back to the technical teams. Um, what I would like to say about anything I say is that um, every, anything I say is based on my own experience. I'm not um, kind of a Chem Centre employee selling their product. And, and they never tell me what to say, um, you know, so at times I can criticize them and they'd accept my, uh, my feedback. So everything I say is based on my personal experience of using it. But on questions in terms of comparative data, um, there is some very useful work going on. But I will pass that back to Kate to ask the development teams who are doing some fantastic work at the moment. Definitely. Thank you so much, for, uh, Sue, for commenting on that. And um, as, as Sue said, I'll take that back to my colleagues and, and get back to you um, on that for the delegates that's asked that question. Um, we've got a, another question here. So again, I think this school have just started using INCAS. Um, it looks like they're an international school. Um, how compatible is INCAS for um, international students and, and, and students who have English as an additional language? Uh, well, that's been my experience of using it generally. It's been with international schools with a number of students with English as an additional language. And I think it's, it's extremely valuable. Um, bear in mind, if they go on to be in English medium education, they will be taking the same exams and, uh, as a uh, as students who have been totally immersed in English medium education. Um, again, I think at, at the very beginning of the presentation, although it says INCAS is for five to 11 year olds, if you find that your very younger students have got very little English, then I cannot, I cannot see much point in doing it then. Because what you get if, they're, um, if their score is below the bottom of the, of the range, what you will get is just an asterisk rather than a score. Um, so, you know, in some schools, I would say it's not worth starting it until years two or three. Um, if you're going to get enough meaningful data to use it in terms of, as I'm saying that, uh, as far as I'm aware, they're working on all sorts of different international comparisons. But um, I have found it in the many international schools I've worked in. I've worked in eight countries, not including the UK. So with the UK, it makes it nine. Um, I found it exceptionally useful. Um, in, in it, often in highlighting the need to develop literacy across the curriculum throughout a, a child's education. Um, you know, international schools do vary. I mean, some are international schools catering for a local population where outside of school, the children are mainly speaking their local language. Um, and that can slow down their literacy development. Others are um, schools for a very mobile uh, international uh, population where English is the lingua franca. And so the language of communication, out, the common language of communication outside school uh, could be English. And it's certainly the English you know, used in school. And then their literacy skills might develop faster. 
but I mean, very often English, you know, English is an additional language. I'm saying additional rather than second, because um, very often children are working in their third or fourth language. And, you know, this, these are all factors which you know, which are unique to your school. And so, you know, comparing yourself with international schools, it's a very broad term because international schools are so different. And many of them consider themselves to be unique because of your particular environment. I think that's it, really. Thank that you so much, wanted. Sue. Oh, no, not at all. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm aware of the time. Um, it's yeah, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I'd, so I I'd just want to make sure we've got one more question covered. Um, so this delegate has asked, how do um, senior leaders, how do we make the data available and accessible and easily understood for our classroom teachers, but also our middle leaders as well? Again, um, there is no substitute for the time that you will need to spend doing it. Um, I think if you just were to announce that um, all this data was available on the, school, you know, on the school management information system, that would be a complete disaster because then they would just go in and it would get data overload and they wouldn't really understand it. Um, and so, um, again, I would refer you back to the presentation I made on Tuesday, which, um, which, which I'm sure Kate can share, um, which would go through that. Um, but if the data is just used by the senior leadership team, then you're not going to have it used effectively. So it really does need to be easily available. It needs to be explained. Um, you might need, actually, I mean, there is, um, I mean, obviously, INCAS itself produces a guide for teachers that you can look at. Um, but I think if you had a little in-house guide with key points, then that would be you know, really quite useful. And again, it needs to be revisited. I think I mentioned earlier, it's best to cascade it out. So I think after the initial big launch, um, which you would need to do and go through it. And it might be like, you know, a whole day's in-service training, going through the data or a half day, you know, a half day looking at the, uh, explaining how it, it's used and then giving them a half day to go through their data. Initially, when you're just launching it um, to the school for the first time, you would need to go through it slowly or in a series of meetings. Let's look at reading schools. Let's look at mental math schools. Um, take one child as an example and go through all of their scores and what it tells you. So it's a case of really taking the time to go through that data. Um, and as I'm saying, there's, there's nothing, but then it becomes very easy to read. Um, if you were to just hand them a box and whisker um, plot of their class, then I think they would just look at you dumbfounded. When I first looked at one of those, I didn't know what it was. I hope I've explained that today because it's a really quick picture for every module. It's really useful. So, you know, these kind of quick wins we need to go for rather than a mountain of data, rather than endless Excel sheets. We need to go for some quick wins. And, you know, I will leave it to your professional judgment to sort those, but I would say take it slowly, go for the pictures rather than the numbers, and um, and then. Uh, I'm sure you'll all be hooked. Thank you so much, Sue. I also really like the idea of the kind of quick and handy guide, um, an internal one. I think that's that's definitely something yeah. that some of our current um, schools are doing as well. So and I think, I think, you know, if you've got, if you can identify a go-to person hmm. in each little team so that someone can go and ask a quick question and also, you know, if you've got um, uh, like a little chat thing, a Q&A session, easily, you know, frequently asked questions where people can post a question and, you know, people don't feel threatened by not understanding stuff because people often do feel threatened. It has to be an open door. If someone says, I don't really understand who, how this works, can anybody help? You know, a quick two minute conversation can suddenly remove an anxiety. So I think these quick questions face to face are really useful. Thank you so much, Sue. I think we're out of time now. Um, so that's that's all we have time for today. Um, and we really hope that you've enjoyed the webinar. Thank you so much for all the questions. There's been quite a lot here. And I think we've covered um, 
looks like we've covered everyone's that came in. If you do have any additional questions for either Sue or someone at Chem, please feel free to drop me an email. I think you've got your you've got an email from GoToWebinar, our webinar provider, which includes my email address. Um, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to you for joining us, but also a huge thank you for Sue for presenting today and taking the time to be with us. Um, just before I do the final goodbyes, as I said, we will send that video recording to you next week so you can revisit the webinar or you can also share it with your colleagues. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Sue for the final thank yous. Well, I'd also like to, to thank Kate for hosting it beautifully as usual. And I particularly like to thank the, um, the listeners. I hope you found it useful. And uh, I would say enjoy your use of INCAS. Thank you very much. <laughs>